Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 593, Hot Lemonade. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am much better. Monoclonal antibodies. After I talked to you last week, I talked to my doctor and I went to the ER (laughs) and I got monoclonal antibodies because I was still within the first seven days of COVID seven days counting from symptom onset. And since most of the symptoms were getting better, except for my breathing, which is kind of important, they decided I was not a good candidate for Paxlovid because of the stuff I take for narcolepsy. So instead, monoclonals. And I am so blown away. They said, you're not going to feel better right away. For one thing, I thought they were going to have to haul in like a wheelbarrow full of IV bags. No. They did not. They had a tiny little vial, like the size of the vial that the vaccines come in. They brought in a tiny little vial, put it into the saline that they had going into my arm at that point. And uh, wow, that worked. So two days later, I woke up feeling remarkably like myself. I still had, I think, one, one day of weird transient headaches. COVID headaches are bad, really, really bad. And I know I did not have the worst of it. So yeah, lousy. So two days later, I woke up feeling like myself and could tell that the only thing left was the pneumonia. Because when I was in the ER, they they took an x-ray. Man, they do not want, at our hospital, they do not want COVID patients walking around. Duh, right? So everything came to the room. It was so relaxing. So they hauled in a mobile x-ray unit. It was so cool. And flipped it up and expanded it and put the x-ray plate behind my back and sat me up and took x-rays. So no COVID lung, which is great because COVID lung is really scary. I don't know if you remember me talking about this a thousand years ago, it feels like. But COVID lung, it looks like there's broken glass in your lungs. That doesn't sound good, right? I know. I have not been reading up on what causes that. I don't even know if they know yet what actually causes that, but yikes. So the happy news, yay, no COVID lung, boo, pneumonia. So my sister and I were were texting back and forth and she asked, how are you feeling? And I said, monoclonals are awesome. Now I just feel like I have pneumonia. And I said, but that's a known known. So it's way better than an unknown known like COVID or even a known unknown like COVID was in the beginning. And she said, so now you just have to get rid of the known pneumonia? Ha, 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 my sister, she's a punny one. So yeah, now I just have pneumonia. And last night, Sai gave me some great advice on the Zoom chat, the Thursday night Zoom. And the advice was this, when you have pneumonia, try to the best of your ability to practice some deep breathing every day. And I said, oh, you mean the the thing that's going to make me cough like a crazy person? And he laughed and said, yeah, go, go easy, but do try and breathe deeply because that helps force the gunk out of the way. And so today on my morning walk, which my morning walks have been very slow this week, uh, on my morning walk, I spent the last quarter mile really focusing on breathing slowly and deeply and walking slowly. And I didn't have a hacking fit until I got back to my car. So thank you, Sai. That really did help. And I'm going to keep working on it. So I feel incredibly lucky and so grateful to all of the doctors and researchers who have been working on things like Paxlovid and monoclonal antibodies and vaccines, because, because the cruel irony of the whole thing was I was supposed to get, I think I mentioned it last week, I was supposed to get my booster shot last, uh, last Wednesday when I was six, so I had to postpone that. So I got the follow-up booster two days ago. And, you know, sore arm and all of that. 
But so far, the Moderna booster has not done to me what the previous booster did. And so I'm wondering if it's because the COVID antibodies are doing their thing too right now. Anyway, it's all, it's all very interesting. I am still watching my TWIV, my This Week in Virology. Their weekly updates come out Saturday mornings, and they are very, very nice to watch. Like I said, bored virologists make me happy. When they get panicky, I get panicky. But bored virologists are good, and watching bored virologists discuss the relative merits of research that's coming out is also very helpful. You get a real sense of where the legitimate news is, regardless of what the media says. And one of the things that I talked about last week was how the, the media has done a really lousy job of explaining what viruses do. And if you think about the word disease as dis, not ease, comfort, viruses are supposed to present, prevent disease. They are supposed to prevent you from getting the worst of something. They can't prevent something from being transmitted necessarily. That would be a sterilizing vaccine, and those are very rare. And they can't prevent you from getting something. But just like the flu shot that I didn't get, what was it, almost 10 years ago, eight years ago, when I got the bad flu and then that went into pneumonia for the first time in my life, that hadn't happened when I got my flu shots before. So the vaccines evidently had kept me from getting bad flu. And this time around, even though I was really late to get my second booster, pretty sure that my case of COVID would have been a lot worse if I hadn't had some memory cells, some T cells and B cells that still had a vague memory of what they were supposed to do in the face of COVID. <sighs> so yeah, very, very grateful. I've been drawing lots of little gratefulness pictures of things like syringes and vials and doctors with masks on. So there we are. But I have other information for you. I have things to share from our Zoom chats. Carmen on Thursday night wanted everybody to know, if you haven't already seen it because it's it's been making the rounds, Dracula Daily. If you listen to Dracula here on Craftlet, you know that it's an epistolary novel. It's one that is written in time and in letters, newspaper articles, train schedules, uh, diary entries that are dated. And so the date that the first event happened, Jonathan Harker going to Transylvania, on that date, Dracula Daily released that chapter. You see where this is going. And so every time a chapter happens with its date, on that date, if you sign up for it, you will receive, I think you receive an email. It's either you receive an email or you receive an email that the post is up on, on the site. Anyway, you can find out more. I am not doing it. I have enough to do right now. <laughs> but Dracula Daily, all one word, dot substack, that's S-U-B as in boy, S-T-A-C-K, all one word, dot com slash about. This link is also in the show notes for episode 593. So you can go there and, and find out more. If you skipped Dracula here, which is a shame because we had really great readers for all the different voices in Dracula, including my brother-in-law, who apologizes to everybody who listens who is Dutch. He did Van Helsing. He is German. <laughs> I told him the percentage of people who would know that his accent was incorrect was slim so that he would, would still be willing to record for me. Also. While Tracy was talking on Tuesday morning about the cozy mystery that she was reading, I went and looked for cozy mysteries and I found a website called cozy-mystery.com. If you are looking for something to read or listen to that is cozy and a mystery, there's a clearinghouse. There is a whole website devoted to a list of all the cozy mysteries. And you can look them up by title, by series, by author. So we looked up cozy-mystery.com slash Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, dash golden, G-O-L-D-E-N, dot H-T-M-L. And there's a list of all of Allison Golden's many books. So have fun and you're welcome. <laughs> and then 
What have I been listening to? I have been listening to the Slow Horses series. You may be familiar with the Apple TV series starring Gary Oldman. If you are not, wow. If you have Apple TV, so worth it. If you don't, I am sorry. I am sure at some point it will be available somewhere else. There is an article at Radio Times that I have linked out to because it does two things. It has pictures and a couple of clips from the series with Gary Oldman playing one of the most irascible figures I've ever come across in book or drama. And it also shows the correct order of the books because the books, while they go in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they also have, I think, three so far. They're not really short stories. They're, I guess they're novellas. They're a couple of hours, maybe two, two and a half hours worth of listening. And those come in between several of the books in time. They're linear. And the people who you meet in those novellas show up in the next novel. Now, do you need to have read the novella to understand what's going on in the next novel? No. But you have a lot more depth of understanding about the character if you do. So he's an interesting writer, Mick Heron. Mick as in M-I, M as in Mary, I-C-K. And his London is not the London that one normally finds in spy novels or espionage novels or thrillers or mysteries. His London is a little bit more low rent. It's very interesting. There are also some interesting overlaps, momentary overlaps between the Rivers of London series and Slow Horses. There are places that get mentioned and, and things. Also, they mention the Angel Islington which is in Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere. So that was fun too. That I've been listening to. And then I know I mentioned it before several weeks ago, the Everything, Everywhere, All at Once movie starring Michelle Yeoh and the grown-up version of the kid who was in The Goonies, who was the spy gadget, the inspector gadget kid. The two of them are spectacular. Jamie Lee Curtis is also in the movie Spectacular. But they were two video essays that Aaron thing one sent me. One is called The Thousand Faces of Michelle Yeoh. And this comes from a channel that both of the kids love. I think it's called Accented Cinema. This guy does really, really good video essays on different aspects of film. He does a lot of analysis on uh, Asian movies and movies made outside of uh, greater Asia that focus on Asian characters. So he's he's really interesting to watch. I really like his things. But he does a beautiful kind of historical essay of Michelle Yeoh, who most people I know in the West only knew about her from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And then she showed up again in Crazy Rich Asians as the about-to-be mother-in-law, the formidable mother-in-law, spectacular. And then Shang-Chi, so she gets to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Evidently twice, I didn't realize she was in Guardians of the Galaxy as well. I didn't remember that. And then she does this everything everywhere all at once, which is extraordinary and weird, really weird and beautiful. I think it's what Cloud Atlas wanted to be in some ways. That was the vibe that I got. It was like a good movie. Cloud Atlas. That video essay I've linked out to you from the show notes. It's lovely. And then that reminded me because so much of what Michelle Yeoh does and so much of what Everything Everywhere All at Once does is clever storytelling with a camera. Fights are very hard for the human eye to track when they go quickly. And the best of Hong Kong cinema and uh, like Jackie Chan movies, the best of them have really, really well edited fight scenes. You're able to follow what's happening. That's how you can have humor, like Jackie Chan's humor, as part of a fight. Same thing with everything everywhere all at once. Same thing with everything Edgar Wright has ever done, whether it's Shaun of the Dead or Baby Driver or his latest movie, Last Night in Soho, starring Thomas and McKenzie, who was the girl in Jojo Rabbit, extraordinary and she, god she's gorgeous or anya taylor joy is also in the movie she was in the queen's gambit and has done many many things prior to that as well 
but the two of them are spectacular. And there is some very, very clever camera work and camera work that tells the story. Uh, uh, stuff that I, my jaw hit the floor. I literally could not figure out how they did it because Edgar Wright doesn't really go in for special effects that are computer generated. Most of what he does is clever camera work. And there are parts of Last Night in Soho where he's doing stuff with mirrors and you can't figure it out. It's just that good. And the answer is, yes, that's true because there's no mirror. And I'll just leave it at that. There are some videos on YouTube where they show and he gets a chance to discuss and really kind of give shout outs to people on his crew and his, his support staff who did really, really smart things. So that's also available for you on the show notes at craftlit.com. Oh, and the last thing for you, I stumbled across this and it made me laugh. Z-A-R-F. If you look up Zarf Coffee, Z-A-R-F, you will find really beautiful coffee cup holders. Evidently, I do not know if this is true, Zarf is the Arabic word for vessel. So we live surrounded by a lot of cardboard Zarfs these days. <laughs> and that is all the stuff I've collected for you. So Joan of Arc, today we will listen to chapters 17, 18, 19, and 20. There's just a couple of things to keep your ears open for. One is, yes, we have two chapters out of the four today that are Mark twain -y chapters. One of them really throws me back into Oscar Wilde's Canterville Ghost. If you listen to Canterville Ghost, I think it'll make sense to you. But it was a weird moment of kind of melancholy and sweet sadness stuff. So that was interesting. But in the Joan chapters, of which we have uh, chapter 18 and chapter 20, Joan gets a, a Richard III moment, except she gets a horse. I can only assume that Twain did this because he knew everybody would know a horse, my kingdom for a horse. So that was funny. That's, I mean, I'm guessing that that was a callback to Shakespeare. It was a little too on the nose not to be. So that's, it just made me laugh. There's also something that I learned in the last week that I thought was interesting about the word bastard. And it is this. We have read lots of books over the years in Craftlet where somebody is called a natural born son or a natural child, meaning they were born out of wedlock. They were born the natural way, not married. This is the other side of that. This is the father, nobility, has claimed the son born out of wedlock. So the fact that he is the bastard of Orléans is identifying him with his lineage on his father's side. So it is not an insult, which is why Joan has been very clear. She doesn't like swearing. I hear you will hear him not swear in front of her today, which is very sweet. But that's why she she refers to Dunois as, the, as bastard. I mean, she just literally will say, hey, bastard, what do you think you're doing? Which sounds funny to our ears, but it actually, I don't want to say it was a term of endearment, but it would have been close to a title. I thought that was interesting. So there you go. And then chapter 20, uh, chapter 20 really gets into the technicalities of the siege of Orléans. If you are more interested in the map, the logistics, all of that, Joan of Arc gives you, this, this version of Joan of Arc gives you a good basis for understanding how the siege went. If you want more information, the easiest place to go is Wikipedia, Battle of Orléans. And from there, you can go out to lots of places. But the reason why I say start there is because they actually have the clearest map that I could find. So if you want to see a map, head on over. Wikipedia's got it. There are lots of 
independent sites and, you know, privately run sites that are kind of angel fire sites that were probably built in the late 90s that are still being run or maintained or not by various people. And therefore, the maps that they have run the gamut. Wikipedia's was the clearest. And that is everything I need to say. So now we're going to listen to two very short and two very medium <laughs> chapters of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, Book One, Volume Two, Chapter Seventeen, Sweet Fruit of Bitter Truth. When we got home, breakfast for us, Minor Fry, was waiting in our mess room, and the family honored us by coming in to eat it with us. The nice old treasurer, and in fact all three, were flatteringly eager to hear about our adventures. Nobody asked the paladin to begin, but he did begin because now that his specially ordained and peculiar military rank set him above everybody on the personal staff but old Dolon, who didn't eat with us, he didn't care a farthing for the knight's nobility, nor mine, but took precedence in the talk whenever it suited him, which was all the time, because he was born that way. He said, "'God be thanked! We found the army in admirable condition. I think I have never seen a finer body of animals.' animals said miss catherine i will explain to you what he means said noel he i will trouble you not to trouble yourself to explain anything for me said the paladin loftily i have reason to think that is his way said noel always when he thinks he has reason to think he thinks he does think uh, but this is an error he didn't see the army i noticed him and he didn't see it he was troubled by his old complaint "'What's his old complaint?' Catherine asked. "'Prudence,' I said, seeing my chance to help. But it was not a fortunate remark, for the paladin said, "'It probably isn't your turn to criticize people's prudence, you who fall out of the saddle when a donkey brays.' They all laughed, and I was ashamed of myself for my hasty smartness. I said, "'It isn't quite fair for you to say I fell out on account of the donkey's braying. It was emotion, just ordinary emotion. Very well, if you want to call it that, I am not objecting. What would you call it, Sir Bertrand? Well, well, whatever it was, it was excusable, I think. All of you have learned how to behave in hot hand-to-hand -hand engagements, and you don't need to be ashamed of your record in that matter, but to walk along in front of death with one's hands idle, and no noise, no music, and nothing going on is a very trying situation. If I were you, de Conte, I would name the emotion. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It was as straight and sensible a speech as ever I heard, and I was grateful for the opening it gave me, so I came out and said, It was fear, and thank you for the honest idea, too. It was the cleanest and best way out, said the old treasurer. You've done well, my lad. That made me comfortable, and when Miss Catherine said, "'It's what I think, too,' I was grateful to myself for getting into that scrape. Sir Jean de Metz said, "'We were all in a body together when the donkey brayed, and it was dismally still at the time. I don't see how any young campaigner could escape some little touch of that emotion.' He looked about him with a pleasant expression of inquiry on his good face and as each pair of eyes in turn met his, the head they were in nodded a confession. Even the paladin delivered his nod. That surprised everybody, and saved the standard-bearer's credit. It was clever of him. Nobody believed he could tell the truth that way without practice, or would tell that particular sort of a truth either with or without practice. I suppose he judged it would favorably impress the family. Then the old treasurer said, Passing the forts in that trying way required the same sort of nerve that a person must have when ghosts are about him in the dark, I should think. What does the standard-bearer think? Well, I don't quite know about that, sir. I've often thought I would like to see a ghost if I— Would you? exclaimed the young lady. We've got one. Would you try that one, will you? She was so eager and pretty that the paladin said straight out that he would— 
and then, as none of the rest had bravery enough to expose the fear that was in him, one volunteered after the other with a prompt mouth and a sick heart till all were shipped for the voyage. Then the girl clapped her hands in glee, and the parents were gratified, too, saying that the ghosts of their house had been a dread and a misery to them and their forebears for generations, and nobody had ever found yet who was willing to confront them and find out what their trouble was, so that the family could heal it and content the poor specters and beguile them to tranquillity and peace. End of chapter 17 Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain Book One, Volume Two, Chapter Eighteen, Joan's First Battlefield About noon I was chatting with Madame Boucher. Nothing was going on, all was quiet, when Catherine Boucher suddenly entered in great excitement and said, Fly, sir, fly! The maid was doing in her chair in my room when she sprang up and cried out, French blood is flowing! My arms! Give me my arms! Her giant was on guard at the door, and he brought Dolon, who began to arm her, and I and the giant have been warning the staff. Fly, and stay by her, and if there really is a battle, keep her out of it. Don't let her risk herself. There is no need. If the men know she is near and looking on, it is all that is necessary. Keep her out of the fight. Don't fail on this. I started on a run, saying sarcastically, for I was always fond of sarcasm, and it was said that I had a most neat gift that way. Oh, yes, nothing easier than that. I'll attend to it. At the furthest end of the house I met Joan, fully armed, hurrying toward the door, and she said, Ah, French blood is being spilt, and you did not tell me. Indeed, I did not know it, I said. There are no sounds of war. Everything is quiet, Your Excellency. You will hear war sounds enough in a moment, she said, and was gone. It was true. Before one could count five, there broke upon the stillness the swelling rush and tramp of an approaching multitude of men and horses, with hoarse cries of command, and then out of the distance came the muffled deep boom, 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 boom of cannon, and straightway that rushing multitude was roaring by the house like a hurricane. Our knights and all our staff came flying, armed, with no horses ready, and we burst out after Joan in a body, the paladin in the lead with the banner. The surging crowd was made up half of citizens and half of soldiers, and had no recognized leader. When Joan was seen, a huzza went up, and she shouted, "'A horse! A horse!' A dozen saddles were at her disposal in a moment. She mounted, a hundred people shouting, "'Way there! Way for the Maid of Orléans!' the first time that that immortal name was ever uttered, and I, praise God, was there to hear it. The mass divided itself like the waters of the Red Sea, and down this lane Joan went skimming like a bird, crying, "'Forward! Forward, French hearts! Follow me!' And we came winging in her wake on the rest of the borrowed horses, the holy standard streaming above us, and the lane closing together in our rear. This was a different thing from the ghastly march past the dismal Bastilles. No, we felt fine now, and all a whirl with enthusiasm. The explanation of this sudden uprising was this. The city and the little garrison, so long hopeless and afraid, had gone wild over Joan's coming, and could no longer restrain their desire to get at the enemy. So, without orders from anybody, a few hundred soldiers and citizens had plunged out at the Burgundy Gate on a sudden impulse, and made a charge on one of Lord Talbot's most formidable fortresses, St. Luc and were getting the worst of it. The news of this had swept through the city and started this new crowd that we were with. As we poured out at the gate we met a force bringing in the wounded from the front. The sight moved Joan, and she said, "'Ah, French blood! It makes my hair rise to see it!' We were soon on the field, soon in the midst of the turmoil. Joan was seeing her first real battle, and so were we. It was a battle in the open field for the garrison of St. Luc had sallied confidently out to meet the attack, being used to victories when witches were not around. The sally had been reinforced by troops from the Paris Bastille, and when we approached the French were getting whipped and were falling back. But when Joan came charging through the disorder with her banner displayed, crying, "'Forward, men! Follow me!' there was a change. The French turned about and surged forward like a solid wave of the sea, and swept the English before them, hacking and slashing, and being hacked and slashed, in a way that was terrible to see. In the field the dwarf had no assignment. 
that is to say he was not under orders to occupy any particular place therefore he chose his place for himself and went ahead of joan and made a road for her it was horrible to see the iron helmets fly into fragments under his dreadful axe he called it cracking nuts and it looked like that he made a good road and paved it well with flesh and iron joan and the rest of us followed it so briskly that we outspeeded our forces and had the english behind us as well as before the knights commanded us to face outward around joan which we did and then there was work done that was fine to see one was obliged to respect the paladin now being right under joan's exalting and transforming eye he forgot his native prudence he forgot his diffidence in the presence of danger he forgot what fear was and he never laid about him in his imaginary battles in a more tremendous way than he did in this real one and wherever he struck there was an enemy the less we were in that close place only a few minutes then our forces to the rear broke through with a great shout and joined us and then the english fought a retreating fight but in a fine and gallant way and we drove them to their fortress foot by foot they facing us all the time and their reserves on the walls raining showers of arrows crossbow bolts and stone cannon-balls upon us the bulk of the enemy got safely within the works and left us outside with piles of french and english dead and wounded for company a sickening sight an awful sight to us youngsters for our little ambush fights in february had been in the night and the blood and the mutilations and the dead faces were mercifully dim whereas we saw these things now for the first time in all their naked ghastliness now arrived dunois from the city and plunged through the battle on his foam-flecked horse and galloped up to joan saluting and uttering handsome compliments as he came he waved his hand toward the distant walls of the city where a multitude of flags were flaunting gaily in the wind and said the populace were up there observing her fortunate performance and rejoicing over it and added that she and the forces would have a great reception now now hardly now bastard not yet why not yet is there more to be done more bastard we have but begun we will take this fortress ah uh, you can't be serious we can't take this place let me urge you not to make the attempt it is too desperate let me order the forces back joan's heart was overflowing with the joys and enthusiasms of war and it made her impatient to hear such talk she cried out bastard bastard will ye play always with these english now verily i tell you we will not budge until this place is ours we will carry it by storm sound the charge ah my general waste no more time man let the bugle sound the assault and we saw that strange deep light in her eye which we named the battle light and learned to know so well in later fields the martial notes pealed out the troops answered with a yell and down they came against that formidable work whose outlines were lost in its own cannon smoke and whose sides were spouting flame and thunder we suffered repulse after repulse but joan was here and there and everywhere encouraging the men and she kept them to their work during three hours the tide ebbed and flowed flowed and ebbed and at last la Hire, who was now come made a final and resistless charge and the bastille st loup was ours we gutted it taking all its stores and artillery and then destroyed it when all our host was shouting itself hoarse with rejoicings and there went up a cry for the general for they wanted to praise her and glorify her and do her homage for her victory we had trouble to find her and when we did find her she was off by herself sitting among a ruck of corpses with her face in her hands crying for she was a young girl you know and her hero heart was a young girl's heart too with the pity and the tenderness that are natural to it she was thinking of the mothers of those dead friends and enemies among the prisoners were a number of priests and joan took these under her protection and saved their lives it was urged that they were most probably combatants in disguise but she said as to that how can any tell they wear the livery of god and if even one of these wears it rightfully surely it were better that all the guilty should escape than that we have upon our hands the blood of that innocent man i will lodge them where i lodge and feed them and send them away in safety we marched back to the city with our crop of cannon and prisoners on view and our banners displayed 
Here was the first substantial bit of war work the imprisoned people had seen in the seven months that the siege had endured, the first chance they had had to rejoice over a French exploit. You may guess that they made good use of it. They and the bells went mad. Joan was their darling now, and the press of people struggling and shouldering each other to get a glimpse of her was so great that we could hardly push our way through the streets at all. Her new name had gone all about, and was on everybody's lips. The Holy Maid of Vaucouleurs was a forgotten title. The city had claimed her for its own, and she was the Maid of Orléans now. It is a happiness to me to remember that I heard that name the first time it was ever uttered. Between that first utterance and the last time it will be uttered on this earth, ah, uh, think how many moldering ages will lie in that gap. The Boucher family welcomed her back as if she had been a child of the house, and saved from death against all hope or probability. They chided her for going into the battle and exposing herself to danger during all those hours. They could not realize that she had meant to carry her warriorship so far, and asked her if it had really been her purpose to go right into the turmoil of the fight, or hadn't she got swept into it by accident and the rush of the troops. They begged her to be more careful another time. It was good advice, maybe, but it fell upon pretty unfruitful soil. End of chapter 18 Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 19, We Burst In Upon Ghosts. Being worn out with the long fight, we all slept the rest of the afternoon away and two or three hours into the night. Then we got up refreshed and had supper. As for me, I could have been willing to let the matter of the ghost drop, and the others were of a like mind, no doubt, for they talked diligently of the battle and said nothing of that other thing and indeed it was fine and stirring to hear the paladin rehearse his deeds and see him pile his dead fifteen here eighteen there and thirty-five yonder but this only postponed the trouble it could not do more he could not go on forever when he had carried the bastille by assault and eaten up the garrison there was nothing for it but to stop unless catherine boucher would give him a new start and have it all done over again as we hoped she would this time but she was otherwise minded as soon as there was a good opening and a fair chance she brought up her unwelcome subject and we faced it the best we could we followed her and her parents to the haunted room at eleven o'clock with candles and also with torches to place in the sockets on the walls it was a big house with very thick walls and this room was in a remote part of it which had been left unoccupied for nobody knew how many years because of its evil repute this was a large room like a salon and had a big table in it of enduring oak and well preserved but the chairs were worm-eaten and the tapestry on the walls was rotten and discolored by age the dusty cobwebs under the ceiling had the look of not having had any business for a century catherine said tradition says that these ghosts have never been seen they have merely been heard it is plain that this room was once larger than it is now and that the wall at this end was built in some bygone time to make and fence off a narrow room there there is no communication anywhere with that narrow room and if it exists and of that there is no reasonable doubt it has no light and no air but is an absolute dungeon wait where you are and take note of what happens that was all then she and her parents left us when their footfalls had died out in the distance down the empty stone corridors an uncanny silence and solemnity ensued which was dismaler to me than the mute march past the bastilles we sat looking vacantly at each other and it was easy to see that no one there was comfortable the longer we sat so the more deadly still that stillness got to be and when the wind began to moan around the house presently it made me sick and miserable and i wished i had been brave enough to be a coward this time for indeed it is no proper shame to be afraid of ghosts seeing how helpless the living are in their hands and then these ghosts were invisible which made the matter the worse as it seemed to me they might be in the room with us at that moment we could not know I felt airy touches on my shoulders and my hair, and I shrank from them and cringed, and was not ashamed to show this fear, for I saw the others doing the like, and knew that they were feeling those faint contacts, too. 
as this went on oh eternities it seemed the time dragged so drearily all those faces became as wax and i seemed sitting with a congress of the dead at last faint and far and weird and slow came a boom 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 a distant bell tolling midnight when the last stroke died that depressing stillness followed again and as before i was staring at those waxen faces and feeling those airy touches on my hair and my shoulders once more one minute two minutes three minutes of this then we heard a long deep groan and everybody sprang up and stood with his legs quaking it came from that little dungeon there was a pause then we heard muffled sobbings mixed with pitiful ejaculations then there was a second voice low and not distinct and the one seemed trying to comfort the other and so the two voices went on with moanings and soft sobbings and ah the tones were so full of compassion and sorry and despair indeed it made one's heart sore to hear it but those sounds were so real and so human and so moving that the idea of ghosts passed straight out of our minds and sir jean de metz spoke out and said come we will smash that wall and set those poor captives free here with your axe the dwarf jumped forward swinging his great axe with both hands and others sprang for torches and brought them bang wang slam smash went the ancient bricks and there was a hole an ox could pass through we plunged within and held up the torches nothing there but vacancy on the floor lay a rusty sword and a rotten fan now you know all that i know take the pathetic relics and weave about them the romance of the dungeon's long vanished inmates as best you can end of chapter nineteen personal recollections of joan of arc by mark twain volume one book two chapter twenty joan makes cowards brave victors the next day joan wanted to go against the enemy again but it was the feast of the ascension and the holy council of bandit generals were too pious to be willing to profane it with bloodshed but privately they profaned it with plottings a sort of industry just in their line they decided to do the only thing proper to do now in the new circumstances of the case feign an attack on the most important bastille on the orleans side and then if the english weakened the far more important fortresses on the other side of the river to come to its help cross in force and capture those works this would give them the bridge and free communication with the sologne which was french territory they decided to keep this latter part of the program secret from joan joan intruded and took them by surprise she asked them what they were about and what they had resolved upon they said they had resolved to attack the most important of the english bastilles on the orleans side next morning and there the spokesman stopped joan said well go on there is nothing more that is all am i to believe this that is to say am i to believe that you have lost your wits she turned to dunois and said bastard you have sense answer me this if this attack is made and the bastille taken how much better off would we be than we are now the bastard hesitated and then began some rambling talk not quite germane to the question joan interrupted him and said that will not do good bastard you have answered since the bastard is not able to mention any advantage to be gained by taking that bastille and stopping there it is not likely that any of you could better the matter you waste much time here in inventing plans that lead to nothing and making delays that are a damage are you concealing something from me bastard this council has a general plan i take it without going into details what is it it is the same it was in the beginning seven months ago to get provisions for a long siege then sit down and tire the english out in the name of god as if seven months was not enough you want to provide for a year of it now ye shall drop these pusillanimous dreams the english shall go in three days several exclaimed ah general general be prudent be prudent and starve do ye call that war i tell you this if you do not already know it the new circumstances have changed the face of matters the true point of attack has shifted it is on the other side of the river now one must take the fortifications that command the bridge the english know that if we are not fools and cowards we will try to do that 
they are grateful for your piety in wasting this day they will reinforce the bridge forts from this side to-night knowing what ought to happen to-morrow you have but lost a day and made our task harder for we will cross and take the bridge forts bastard tell me the truth does not this council know that there is no other course for us than the one i am speaking of dunois conceded that the council did know it to be the most desirable but considered it impracticable and he excused the council as well as he could by saying that inasmuch as nothing was really and rationally to be hoped for but a long continuance of the siege and wearying out of the english they were naturally a little afraid of joan's impetuous notions he said you see we are sure that the waiting game is the best whereas you would carry everything by storm that i would and moreover that i will you have my orders here and now we will move upon the forts of the south bank to-morrow at dawn and carry them by storm yes carry them by storm la hire came clanking in and heard the last remark and he cried out by my baton that is the music i love to hear yes that is the right time and the beautiful words my general we will carry them by storm he saluted in his large way and came up and shook joan by the hand some member of the council was heard to say it follows then that we must begin with the bastille st john and that will give the english time to joan turned and said give yourselves no uneasiness about the bastille st john the english will know enough to retire from it and fall back on the bridge bastilles when they see us coming she added with a touch of sarcasm even a war council would know enough to do that itself then she took her leave la hire made this general remark to the council she is a child and that is all ye seem to see keep to that superstition if you must but you perceive that this child understands this complex game of war as well as any of you and if you want my opinion without the trouble of asking for it here you have it without ruffles or embroidery by god i think she can teach the best of you how to play it joan had spoken truly the sagacious english saw that the policy of the french had undergone a revolution that the policy of paltering and dawdling was ended that in place of taking blows blows were ready to be struck now therefore they made ready for the new state of things by transferring heavy reinforcements to the bastilles of the south bank from those of the north the city learned the great news that once more in french history after all these humiliating years france was going to take the offensive that france so used to retreating was going to advance that france so long accustomed to skulking was going to face about and strike the joy of the people passed all bounds the city walls were black with them to see the army march out in the morning in that strange new position its front not its tail toward an english camp you shall imagine for yourselves what the excitement was like and how it expressed itself when joan rode out at the head of the host with her banner floating above her we crossed the river in strong force and a tedious long job it was for the boats were small and not numerous our landing on the island of saint aignan was not disputed we threw a bridge of a few boats across the narrow channel thence to the south shore and took up our march in good order and unmolested for although there was a fortress there st john the english vacated and destroyed it and fell back on the bridge forts below as soon as our first boats were seen to leave the orleans shore which was what joan had said would happen when she was disputing with the council we moved down the shore and joan planted her standard before the bastille of the augustines the first of the formidable works that protected the end of the bridge the trumpets sounded the assault and two charges followed in handsome style but we were too weak as yet for our main body was still lagging behind before we could gather for a third assault the garrison of saint prive were seen coming up to reinforce the big bastille they came on a run and the augustines sallied out and both forces came against us with a rush and sent our small army flying in a panic and followed us slashing and slaying and shouting jeers and insults at us joan was doing her best to rally the men but their wits were gone their hearts were dominated for the moment by the old-time dread of the english joan's temper flamed up and she halted and commanded the trumpets to sound the advance then she wheeled about and cried out if there is but a dozen of you that are not cowards it is enough follow me away she went and after her a few dozen who had heard her words and been inspired by them 
the pursuing force was astonished to see her sweeping down upon them with this handful of men and it was their turn now to experience a grisly fright surely this is a witch this is a child of satan that was their thought and without stopping to analyze the matter they turned and fled in a panic our flying squadrons heard the bugle and turned to look and when they saw the maid's banner speeding in the other direction and the enemy scrambling ahead of it in disorder their courage returned and they came scouring after us la hire heard it and hurried his force forward and caught up with us just as we were planting our banner again before the ramparts of the augustines we were strong enough now we had a long and tough piece of work before us but we carried it through before night joan keeping us hard at it and she and la hire saying we were able to take that big bastille and must the english fought like well they fought like the english when that is said there is no more to say we made assault after assault through the smoke and flame and the deafening cannon blasts and at last as the sun was sinking we carried the place with a rush and planted our standard on its walls the augustines was ours the tourelles must be ours too if we would free the bridge and raise the siege we had achieved one great undertaking joan was determined to accomplish the other we must lie on our arms where we were hold fast to what we had got and be ready for business in the morning so joan was not minded to let the men be demoralized by pillage and riot and carousings she had the augustines burned with all its stores in it excepting the artillery and ammunition everybody was tired out with this long day's hard work and of course this was the case with joan still she wanted to stay with the army before the tourelles to be ready for the assault in the morning the chiefs argued with her and at last persuaded her to go home and prepare for the great work by taking proper rest and also by having a leech look to a wound which she had received in her foot so we crossed with them and went home just as usual we found the town in a fury of joy all the bells clanging everybody shouting and several people drunk we never went out or came in without furnishing good and sufficient reasons for one of these pleasant tempests and so the tempest was always on hand there had been a blank absence of reasons for this sort of upheavals for the past seven months therefore the people took to the upheavals with all the more relish on that account end of chapter twenty all right so the thing that was going through my mind after chapter 20 or during chapter 20 was wow how many more times are these guys going to not trust joan to be able to play with the big boys and it's anyone's guess how long would it take normally joan is certainly showing them up i can only think of it as depression that the guys were working within as their framework was kind of the yeah we know that it would be better to act fast and hit hard but that'll never work anyway so let's just sit here and wait them out and starve ourselves and that kind of dispirited disillusioned thinking is something that i hear a lot coming from different people of late the oh it's not going to get any better why bother i don't know why i bother to try they're all bad i'm not going to vote all of these things are easy to disprove, but hard to recognize their disprovability from within depression. So I guess where I'm going is be more Joan. Just do it. Just do the thing. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. But you will definitely not have it work if you don't give it a shot. Right? We all know what will happen if we don't vote. Other people will make decisions for us that affect our lives. That's no good. We all know what will happen if we don't get out of bed in the morning and put our shoes on and start moving. We will stay in bed and nothing will get any better either. And I know, I know, you know, I know that from the inside, every positive statement is a lie when you are in a really bad bout of depression. So if you find yourself there, just, just remember, be more Joan and things will get better. All right. Take care. Be well. Wear a mask. Get a vaccine. Take care of each other. I will talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, 
which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>